everybody, and welcome to episode 651 of the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear. I am your writer, host, producer, Derek M. Cook. The podcast is Monster Kid Radio, and the song you're hearing right now is Armed and Crazy in Space. It's from the band The Hamiltones. They're a surf band based out of Buffalo, New York. You can find this song on their album In Space that just came out earlier this month. Go check them out at The Hamiltones. Dot bandcamp.com when you're done listening to this episode of the podcast. This week is the last week we have of all the fill-in episodes that guest host Steve Turek did for us while we were supposed to be in Kuwait. He and Mark Holmes got together to talk about a particular show from Germany, and I can't pronounce it, so I'm bringing in a ringer to pronounce the name of the show for everybody. Raum Patrol, the Fastatischen Abenteuer des Raumschiffes Orion. Okay, one, that was really hot. But two, that translates to Space Patrol, the fantastic adventures of the spaceship Orion. Thanks to my wife, Beth, for filling in for me there. Despite my German last name, I can't speak or read a lick of the language. She can. And Mark Holmes kind of can, maybe? You'll find out when you listen to this episode and the conversation that he has with Steve about this interesting science fiction series that showed on German television in the 1960s around the same time that another very popular science fiction show debuted here in the States. I think you all know what I'm talking about, but they'll talk about it during their conversation here later in the episode. They're not going to talk about the entire run. There were only seven episodes. We're going to talk about a few of the episodes, and then later on down the line, they're going to come back and talk about the rest of it in another one or two episodes. Also in this week's episode, of course, it's Kenny's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland, and he's going to talk about another science fiction classic television show that was covered in Famous Monsters, I think. You'll have to listen to a segment to find out. Plus, we can't get enough science fiction around here, and we can never get enough Ultraman. So Mark Matsky is here to talk about the return of Ultraman during his beta capsule review. That's all coming up here in a moment. At the end of the episode, you're going to hear the song that you're hearing right now, Armed and Crazy, in space in its entirety. And I'll tell you about what's coming up over the next few weeks of Monster Kid Radio then as well. So stay tuned for that. But first, let's get to the rest of the show right now. commanding. We are leaving that vast cloud of stars and planets which we call our galaxy. The question, what is out there in the black void beyond? This is Captain Kirk of the USS Enterprise. Is there anyone on board? Is there anyone on board? Have you raised anyone, Lieutenant? Nothing, sir. It is an unmanned probe which seems to be carrying a warhead. William Shatner stars as Captain Kirk and Leonard Nimoy as science officer Spock on Star Trek in color. satellite will die. And yet you propose to follow this tenth failure with another attempt, using more of your volunteers? The future come to life today. The fantastic story of Project Sigma. Earth's first manned satellite for the invasion of outer space. Monstrous space rockets propelled at the speed of light through the solar system and the galaxies, joining in the cosmos to travel to worlds beyond. War of the satellites. From 
unseen, unknown planets comes a warning of horror that the United Nations cannot ignore. We are obviously in the grip of a force stronger than we can oppose. The invasion of Earth by a race of supermen from outer space, possessing the weird power of duplicating themselves indefinitely. Creatures taking on human form, yet impervious to any destructive force known to man. Look out. The terrors of space travel. The first death and burial in the cosmic void, millions of miles away. An insidious enemy on board, trying to stop man from reaching beyond the limits of our own solar system. Signal barrier dead ahead. Crash emergency. All hands secure for blast. Live from the Land of Light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty Ultra Heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. Return of Ultraman, Episode 44, To the Starry Sky with Love, original air date, February 11th, 1972. Kishida's invention, the ultra-long-range radar, can detect objects three times further away than ever before. Leaving the scene of the radar base, Kishida and Go encounter a car burning with blue phosphorescence and rescue the person trapped inside. The source of the blue flame appears to be two glowing eyes that hover above the accident site. Go hits it with his trusty MAT chute, and the laser provokes a monstrous roar, but nothing else is observed. While MAT tries to debunk Go's hypothesis that the accident was caused by a monster, Kishida keeps returning to the hospital, clearly smitten with the woman they pulled from the wreckage. When he tells her that he's invented a radar, she has a mental breakdown, and at the same time, a saber-toothed, fire-breathing monster emerges from underground, laying waste to a construction site near the radar base. When Kishida turns to leave, his love interest Akane tells him to never come back, but gives him a charm pendant about which she says, treat this as if it were me. MAT converges to protect the radar base from Kaiju Granadus, and Kishida, apparently despondent at Akane's rejection, tries to take the monster out himself, narrowly avoiding getting crushed. Go conducts his own investigation, meeting Akane outside the hospital just as she's being discharged, and there he learns an incredible tragic secret about her identity. To the starry sky with love is another quality outing, capped off by an unexpectedly emotional conclusion. In many ways, it typifies Return of Ultraman's strengths, such as inventive storytelling and gorgeous cinematography, as well as its main weakness, the declining quality of monster suits. The lack of facial detail, odd reflector eyes, and overall look which suggests a weird riff on Gamera considerably lessens the impact Granadus should have had in a story that plays his threat completely straight. Even so, there are plenty of standout elements to episode 44, such as Kishida's character arc as a broken-hearted suitor, and a conversation between aliens that touches on the deepest themes of the Ultraman legend. And did I mention the explosions? Yeah, there are a ton of explosions. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Matsky reporting. Reach for the sky. Come on, this is Space Patroller Jack Norris, and I got you covered with a cosmic smoke gun. Okay, gang, drop your dukes. I'm only kidding. Don't reach for the sky. Reach for rice checks and wheat checks. Because they're the breakfast cereals you got to buy to get a cosmic smoke gun like this for your very own. And boy, is this gun ever different. Watch her in action. That's a puff of cosmic smoke, gang. Yes, there's nothing old-fashioned about this gun, not with cosmic smoke shooting out of it like this. 
Say, remember how this gun got the commander out of a jam not long ago? You bet. This gun does things that an old-fashioned gun could never do. That's why it's so much fun to have a cosmic smoke gun when you're playing Space Patrol. Now, take a closer look at the Space Patrol cosmic smoke gun. Like the way it nestles in my hand? Well, it'll fit nice and easy in your hand, too. And man, is it ever built. It's made of real hard plastic and made real good. The color? Rocket Fire Red. Now, your gun comes to you loaded, and with it, you get this. A bag of reloading powder, enough to last you a long time. And tell Mom this, the powder is guaranteed harmless. Now, to get a gun, get a box of bite-sized rice checks or wheat checks, the new shredded Ralston. Along with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and a rice checks or wheat checks box top to Cosmic Smoke Gun, Box 812, St. Louis, Missouri. I repeat, send 25 cents in coin and a rice checks or wheat checks box top to Cosmic Smoke Gun, Box 812, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in continental United States and may be withdrawn at any time. From the world of tomorrow comes a thrilling new television series, Lost in Space. Here are the amazing adventures of a group of space pioneers marooned on an uncharted planet. Adventure as challenging as tomorrow, as far out as the stars. Spectacle beyond imagination as the astronauts struggle for survival in a strange new world where incredible dangers seem to wait at every turn. Intriguing, thrilling, challenging. These are the adventures you will share. Lost in Space. Hello there, Monster Kid Radioheads. This is Kenny with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. This week's subject, the German TV show Space Patrol Orion, was not featured in classic Famous Monsters. But when I watched a bit of it, I was reminded of a space-related show that was covered in FM, Space 1999. In FM 130, from December of 1976, this cerebral, special effects-laden British sci-fi merited 10 pages with 15 photos. The article begins with this introduction of the show. In the vastness of the universe, among the uncounted stars, life forms must exist. Some will be humanoid, like us. Many, however, will be as different from ourselves as we are different from insects. On September 1999, the most devastating explosion in the history of mankind blasted the moon out of orbit and sent it speeding into the depths of outer space, with 311 men and women trapped in an artificial environment called Moon Base Alpha. The aliens of outer space will learn about Earthmen by observing these people. John Kennick, Martin Landau, who found himself the reluctant commander of a space probe rather than the weather station which was Moonbase Alpha's prime directive. He was born in 1959 and watched the first moon landings on TV. Quiet and strong, he's a man who inspires fierce loyalty. The medical officer, Dr. Helena Russell, Barbara Bain. It is her function to care for the psychological and physical well-being of everyone on the base. The chief scientist is Dr. Victor Bergman, Barry Morse, a brilliant sensitive man whose attitude toward alien life forms is one of scientific curiosity, not fear of the unknown. The article then continues by highlighting several episodes that featured monstrous aliens. It paid more attention to two episodes that featured Hammer Greats, Peter Cushing, and Christopher Lee, respectively. The author of the article pulled no punches when criticizing the show in his descriptions, and he concluded with these comments. Space 1999 has been criticized as being unexciting, slow-paced, and predictable. Their scripts have been trite, the costumes drab, the acting zombie-like, and the music incidental instead of rousing. The special effects by Brian Johnson and cameraman Nick Alder, on the other hand, are excellent and save the show. 
But according to our English correspondent, we may have hope. The second season of Space 1999 holds promise. Many of the above criticisms seem to have been noted by the producers, and they are making an effort to correct them. Some of the changes will be 1. The drab unisex costumes will change. The clothes will be more colorful and more casual. After all, one way to assert individuality is through dress. Number two, Moon Base Alpha will go underground. With all the crashes and attacking aliens we've seen, it seems logical to devise a more defensible command post. Alpha is totally exposed at all times. Also, it gives the personnel something to do during the long, tedious months between segments in space. Number three, most importantly, An alien will be permanently enlisted among the Alphans. This will launch the first episode of the new series and introduce Maya, a female humanoid who has the power to transform herself into anything she wishes. If the show continues with this attitude, learning from its mistakes, then Space 1999 may last until 1999. Alas, it did not. It only lasted one more season. And even with Star Wars Fever being released the next year, it did not spark enough interest to continue. I remember being excited about the show as a kid, but had a similar reaction to it. I didn't get the stories and found them boring, but I loved their shuttle ship and had a die cast model of it, and I faithfully watched each episode. I wonder if it was over my head at the time, and might take a second look to see if I get it as an adult. That is all for this week's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. We will have more next time. For MKR, this is Kenny saying adios. Unprepared. UFO sighted 428143. Red alert. Red alert. They brought death from a dying planet. They had to kill in order to live. They had to be stopped before it was too late. came from everywhere at once. There was no time for defense. It's invasion, UFO, and it's Earth's last chance. In the year 2285, a catastrophe of galactic proportions threatened all Earth life with extinction. News of this catastrophe caused panic and riots. The leaders of planet Earth selected species to seed other planets in an effort to save the legacy and culture of the human race. In order to do this, they built Earthship Ark, a spaceship 8,000 miles in character. The Ark left Earth in the year AD 2285, containing the selected species and culture each living in separate and isolated biospheres. It is now the year 2790. The inhabitants of Earth's ship arc are unknowingly on a collision course with a Class G solar star 5,000 miles in character, thus threatening the destruction of all mankind. Earth's ship arc, man's greatest and final achievement, out of control, drifting through deep space over 800 years into the far future. Its passengers, descendants of the last survivors of the dead planet Earth, locked in separate worlds, their destination long forgotten, heading for destruction unless three young people can save the Star Lost. This is Count Dracula, and I'm here to offer you a friendly warning. Derek and his guests often get excited, and occasionally this results in revealing key plot points of the movies they're discussing. You know how the children of the night, ah, I mean monster kids, can get sometimes. So consider yourself warned. 
and don't come begging to me to kill them for their transgressions afterward. I have more pressing issues to take care of, like that pesky Van Helsing. Hello, everybody. Welcome again to Monster Kid Radio. This is Steve Turk, or I should say Steve Rivers, Joan Rivers' younger brother, subbing in for Derek, because if Derek's not here, I'm the Joan Rivers-type co-host of Steve Rivers. Derek and Beth are in Kuwait working on building haunts for people out there and hopefully having a good time and a safe time, and I know you're all anticipating the when they come back hopefully safely and have their fun. But I'm doing some fill-in episodes for him, and I'm joined today with Mark Holmes, and we're going to be talking about Space Patrol, the fantastic adventures of Spaceship Orion. Besides other titles, that's the full title. But before we get into that, how are you doing today, Mark? I'm doing well. Happy to be here. Okay. And it's called Rom Patroli Olean, which translates into Space Patrol Orion in the original German. Yes. I was not even going to try that. I saw that word. I was just like, uh, I'm going to leave that to Mark. I told Mark, all the Germans, I'm leaving that to you. You picked it. You get to suffer with it. <laughs> okay. Well, back in 1966, a uh, groundbreaking science fiction show about a crew of uh, deep space explorers, premieres, and changed television forever in West Germany. We also had a little-known show over here in the United States called Star Trek with an extremely similar premise with the handsome captain who's bold and brash and the uh, very logical first officer and those crew that follow that will follow him anywhere. And over in Germany, they made almost the exact same show. And uh, as far as anybody can tell, neither production was aware that the other one existed at the time. So uh, Hollywood made Star Trek, and West Germany made Rom Patrol Orion. And I was surprised when you brought it up, because I one, I'd never heard about it. And I think most of our people listening to this probably have no idea about the show. It is readily available on YouTube in um, English subtitles. So if you, you know, look at the show notes, you can type in the name. It'll pop right up, and all seven episodes are there, and each one's a about an hour, some are a few minutes more, some are a few minutes less than around that time frame. And it, it was it was really like, I was watching this and you told me it was like the German version of Star Trek and I enjoyed it, but to give listeners an idea, it's a smaller crew. You know, you're talking six people, so you really get to know each one of these characters better and it just focuses a lot more on their adventures, but it also takes place on Earth in space, space station. So it has a lot of different things it can go with. And it's interesting with the effects and the premise because it reminded me, like you said, a lot with Star Trek. It's in black and white. But it also gave me a Doctor Who vibe because you know they're working with a lower budget, but they really were able to stretch the money out production-wise and make it look so much better than it is. So I got to give credit in the music was really good. So I was really impressed. I watched the first three episodes and we'll be talking mostly about the production and those three. And uh, Mark and I talked earlier, we're going to come back and talk about the last four episodes in another episode of Monster Kid right. Radio. <laughs> the production was like, like you mentioned, was extremely low budget. There was a uh, science fiction convention where one of the stars of uh, Ron Patroli met one of the stars of Star Trek. And they were just talking about, you know, their various shows. And uh, the Star Trek guy mentioned what their per episode budget was. And the German actor said that was our budget for our entire season. So the, the behind the scenes people, first of all, uh, they were filming on a huge soundstage and they used every inch of it. The sets are extremely wide and extremely tall. And there are large, long camera shots that show you everything. And it doesn't look like there's any right angle in the future. Everything is swooping and sweeping. And there's no straight walls. They, they like, curve. So they really use their imagination to present what possibly the future would look like. And I I love that because it's such a different take with how things would be done. It's also comparing it to space 
the science fiction movies of that time, you know, in the 50s and 60s, how they did oh, the yeah. ship designs and how they did, the, like you said, the, the set designs. I love the shuttle that they were using. To me, that, that, that was just awesome how they did the design with it had that bubble effect with the windows and how it worked. I mean, that, that to me would be so cool. I would love to have something similar built in the backyard as like an adult playhouse type thing where you right. can go in there and just have some spot where you can curl up and read a book or watch something. I mean, it's just, it's such a neat design. Uh, the, uh, the, the Orion is a flying saucer. There's no other way to describe it. And the shuttle, just like Stephen just mentioned, is sort of a bubble. And on this bubble, they have little bubbles where all the viewports are. And it really is an interesting design. It gives you a 360 degree view when you're inside of it. And it's really neat the way they just uh, buzz around. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the music. Mm -hmm. It's got a tremendous uh, futuristic jazz theme. Now, I'm not much of a musician. I can't tell you all the notes and things like that. But I love a good horn section. And the horn section really brings it on this show. I mean, you want to, your heart starts racing a little bit when they're playing the, the action adventure music, when they're launching the ship or during an action scene. The, the music's great because when they switch to a lot of times, no one, there's no dialogue and they're showing the ship in motion or whatever. They got the music playing and you're just, it, it just perks you up. And the music does keep things moving along, which, which is good because sometimes the one negative, the only negative I can really think of with the show is there are some times where it gets a little just talky and oh the my, music yes. picks in and it, it kind of perks you back up. So I wish there was a few, at least with the episodes I've seen so far, a little more, a few more action scenes. But on the other hand, as we'll get to them, there are some episodes with very good tension. You know, is things going to happen with a lot of little Epi where normal cliffhangers would happen in an episode, there's one episode, I know we'll talk about episode two, where it's like multiple little cliffhangers, which would have been a normally just one episode of, let's say, Star Trek or another type of, any type of science fiction. But this one has like, it's almost like three episodes put into one. And I think it's because it's got that 55 minute, 60 minute running time. And this, this is without commercials. This is just straight through. So it's like a, almost a, almost a movie length, like a short movie length time frame for each episode and it shows with the plotting whether good or bad with pacing and right I, I completely agree with you there are the scenes back on earth well the crew is a tight unit they're more like a family than they are a crew they're constantly bantering with each, with each other they bicker they, they tease each other uh the guys were with the one uh female officer and then when the new officer comes on board, they immediately try to flirt with her and she shuts them down. So, but uh, the scene back on Earth when the generals are talking, they need to edit. They, they, they could really cut some of that down. But we don't know what German uh, drama was like. The German audience maybe liked that kind of stuff and they liked the backstory where the people are doing a lot of exposition. You know, that, now, the exposition also could have been covering up for the fact they can't show you everything. So they're going to have to tell you everything. Yeah. And which I had no problem with. I understand that. I, I'm, I'm not, I said, it's the only thing I can give it really. I enjoyed the three episodes that I've seen and looking forward to watching the next four, which I think is the best thing to say about a show is when you watch the first episode and you're looking forward to the second and the third, I think the first episode is not as good as the second and the third one. Uh, once you get through, once you watch episode two, you're going to want to watch the next five episodes because you're going to, and after episode three, there's no reason for me not to watch episode, you know, the next four, because it's just, it's built up where it's gotten better with each one. And that's, I think a good sign. And, I'm, and I saw the titles and I've read little descriptions about the next four episodes. So I'm really curious how it goes. And also from what I read, it did rather well i mean people wanted it to continue it just had for whatever reason it stopped would have still ran, ran out of storylines or production or money but there was a book series too and the book series was that prior to the, the tv show or did it come out with the tv show as a companion because it went for 145 novelizations they produced, they produced seven episodes of an hour each and the common theory of why the show was canceled was budget 
But uh, the widow of the main writer said that it was uh, lack of good script. He said that they just weren't excited about doing a second series because the scripts they were getting were not that good. But if there, I believe that the budget answer is the if money rules everything. If they did not get a return on their investment, uh, this, you got to remember this was 1966. Uh, in the United States, they were just transitioning into color TV, and Germany was a couple of years behind us at that time. And uh, there was a big push to start filming everything in color, which would have just raised the price even more. So you got to remember that the show was also filmed in Bavaria, which is the uh, southern section of Germany, which is where my half of my family comes from, which is not known for uh, technolo te technological things. So it would be like filming a science fiction show in the rural countryside. So they just they used what they had on hand. Uh, Germany at this time in 1966 was still recovering from World War II 20 years later. And the show was incredibly progressive because you have to remember, Germany was split in half with the uh, United States and Allies, I won't say being in control, but in the western part of Germany. And the Soviet Union had a huge dominance over the eastern part of Germany. So the show was pretty progressive because it's uh, its female lead was actually a Russian woman. So, you know, the, act, the, the character was Russian. But in the very opening credit, they tell you that in the future, countries don't exist anymore. It's one big united Earth. And uh, the human race has reached out in space. And they colonized many, many worlds and they've explored many different star systems. So it's, it's part of that Star Trek utopia where everything on Earth is great, and they have to go out in space to get into trouble. Yeah, and, and that's what I love about it. it. It has that positive future view of how things are going to be united and looking at it, and that a lot of the problems that we're dealing with today, or in 1966, whichever way you want to look at it, in the future are going to be um, taken care of. And I think it, so it has that same positive messaging as Star Trek did. Now the cast is diverse sexually, you know, male, female through it, especially right. with the supporting characters in various positions of power. Cause you have male generals, female generals and so on. Right. And, 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 but obviously because West Germany being the culture was, and I guess what the population had in 66, you don't really see it in um, um, race, racial aspects with the diversity wow. because they just didn't have it there at that time. They could only draw on the actors that, probably lived within 20 miles of the studio. Exactly. So, so when we're talking about if they, I think if it would have been available, they would have done it, but yeah, it just wasn't give, there. Once again, given a bigger budget, I'm pretty sure that show would have been a lot sharper. And he's one, one of the uh, crew members name is Tsubiyashi, which you would assume is a Japanese character, but of course he's played by a German male actor. And speaking of you, the, the lead character, Major Cliff Alistair um, McLean. You know, so you got you got this guy who right off the bat, United Kingdom, and you know, so you're, you're dealing with that, and you're dealing with a lot of um, whiskey is used in this show, at least in the first three episodes. It <laughs> is drunk as much as water. I mean, there it's whiskey, whiskey, whiskey. <laughs> Their favorite hangout is a uh, underwater. Uh, Place called the Starlight Casino, which I don't know why they call it the Starlight Casino because in the actual show you see the ceiling, which is glass, and it's under the ocean, and you see large fish swimming overhead. So, why you would name something Starlight when it's under the ocean is beyond me. But <laughs> yeah, that, 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 it's an interesting name for the casino. I agree with you, but I do love the image of having the giant fish. Going through, I thought that effect, you know, for 1966 with the budget they have was done really well. You know, you don't, it, it holds done, up nice. That was done with the traditional blue screening of the day. And uh, they actually had to film that in color because it didn't work in black and white. And then they had to 
uh, process it in black and white. So that was a bit of an expense that, you know, they chose to use that. It's a, it's a stunning visual effect. And for listeners wondering, we, basically, not only do we go out into space and have um, space, space stations and outposts and all these different planets and everything else. But we've also inhabited the oceans. So we have these bases in the water, in the ocean area and in the ship, at least every episode I've seen when it goes out from the base, you always see it coming up from the water, you know, and, and, and doing that image. And I thought, you know, it's rather clever showing it's not just because I think a lot of shows would never go into the water. I think a lot of shows at this time or even now, would never think, oh, we can show space, but they're not going to think, hey, we're also going to use the oceans because, you know, most of the, most of the land is underwater, so it would make sense. In a, much, in a much later episode, it hinted at that there was some kind of ecological disaster that drove the human race to live under the ocean. And they actually launched their starships from underwater, which is a really cool effect. You know, it, it's really neat to watch and be at. Uh, the, uh, they, they wear pretty monotone clothes. It's either black or gray. You know, of course they're filming in black and white, but there's no sense of color in their, uh, civilian clothes. And the, uh, female officers wear a, uh, form fitting body suit with a really sharp tailored jacket when they're on the ship. But when they're on Earth, they change to a skirt. And the male officers wear what looks like extremely comfortable pajamas. I mean, I could really hang out in Cliff's uniform. It looks like something you could wear every day. You can. And the, the, one, the one really thing, fun thing that really stands out is all the women in the universe have the exact same hairstyle. You're either blonde or brunette or uh, platinum blonde. And you have this bob effect with a headband, and I wouldn't call them sideburns, but your front bang like rocket forward, like tough, and it looks really cool. Every woman, if you see a woman from behind, you can say, "Well, that's a blonde or that's a brunette," and that's all. I can't tell who it is because her hair is exactly the same as every other woman. Was that was a really. Awesome. I was going to bring that up too. I was like, the very first episode, not long in, you start to realize. They all got the same hairstyle and they all go to the same, in my opinion, wig maker, you know, for a second, everything you could just tell it's a wig and it's just, but it's just amazing. I was like, wow, it's a universal style for women. I mean, this, this gotta be the easiest thing when you go to get your hair done. You're just like, oh yes, you know, you know what I want. Yeah. Cause everybody else has it. Too. So in the very first episode, right in the beginning, we have a little bit of a narration that sets up, the uh, world we live in, where they tell you, you know, the world is at peace, there is no more countries, it's all united, there are uh, starships that travel at incredible speeds, and people live out of the ocean, and there are human colonies out in space, and, uh, we're, and then the, the narrator gets, like, very personal, we're going to concentrate on the crew of this, you know, spaceship Orion, and we're going to follow their adventure. And right off the bat, uh, our hero, Cliff, or the crew calls him Cliff. They call him Commander. You know, sometimes they call him McLean when they're a little upset with him. He's bringing the ship in on an illegal landing on a planet. You can overhear the uh, communicator from Earth telling him, don't do it, stop, back off. They give him what's known as an alpha order, which is an order that you cannot refuse. And he just ignores it all, and his crew is right along with him. And they swoop right in, and they make a very uh, impressive landing on a planet that nobody said you could ever do it. So he, when he, he and the crew are immediately hauled in and called on the carpet, and uh, they're demoted from their frontline duties to space patrol duties. And right away, they want to quit. When his immediate commander, who is a woman, a general, she tells him, right after punishment, and then you'll be under my command again, and she winks at him. Once again, there's that open flirtation between the males and females. 
which you know I don't think would really fly in, a, in any kind of disciplined military service. <laughs> well, this is the future, but yeah, you know, you're right. But General Van Dyke, um, li- um, played by Charlotte Kerr, she comes yeah. in and she's she's not happy because they tell her, "Oh, we're going to be demoting him," and you're asking me, you asking my opinion, you know, no, we're just telling you before we tell him, when's he coming in? Oh, right. any minute now, you know, and it, so it was basically, this is what's going to happen and we're going to do it. And, and, and he's going to quit. And she's like, don't be like, um, oh, well, how did she put it up? Uh, don't be like a, 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 some, some type of cadet, you know, don't be uh, embarrassed. Don't be a, cadet. a what? Like a child. Don't be like a childish cadet. You don't be like a child as cadet. It's only three years and you'll be back under my command. And that's when you said like the wink comes in. And I was just like, yeah, she knows, she knows what she has. She has a guy that's a maverick, but he gets stuff done. And you, and for their type of things, you need certain people like that. So he has the captain Kirk imprint on him, you know, where he's going to do stuff somewhat by somewhat what they want him to do. And sometimes it's not going to be what they want to do, but in the end it ends up being, something positive he tells her superior that we need men like him if we're ever going to make it into the future and then right away one of the uh underlings says in a couple of years robots are going to be doing all the work out in space anyway and we won't need men like him at all so they uh in order for him to comply with the orders that he's been given they assign a new officer to his ship it was a very tight crew of five four men and one woman. And then they assign a new officer from the security service. And this is the uh, Russian woman. Now, once I thought, like I, like I said earlier, at this time, the Soviet Union was right across the street. And my dad was in the army. And he did a couple of tours in Ger- Germany. And it was a very real threat that they were afraid that they were going to come over the border and try to grab all of Germany. So the tensions in the real world were high, but here in the future, nobody cares about that anymore. They're more upset that an officer that doesn't come from the space service is now going to be serving on the uh, ship as a security officer, which people who are familiar with the uh, movie, the hunt for red October would be known as a political officer in the Russian Navy, somebody that watches over the crew and is ready to report anybody who steps out of line. You know, I don't know about you, but I would not want to work in that kind of environment where there's always a snoop. That's what they call her. They call her a snoop. And another one, after they meet her and they talk to her for a few minutes, another officer called her a robot. But she's just so formal. Yeah, she is that way. And if I remember Right, the full title of their thing is security service. And they keep saying security service. We're part of the security service. And of course, this is being filmed in Germany. Right. S S I mean it's it's like it's 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 right there. The security service is the English translation. Uh once again, they took great they actually have laws in Germany about how fascists are depicted in television and movie. You know, they, they had a, they had some trouble showing uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark in Germany because of reasons like that. And uh, Hydra was created for the Marvel movie, not for the, well, Hydra was in Marvel Comics, but they specifically used Hydra in the Marvel movie so they could get that German audience without cutting the movie. So in German, it, uh, it's the GSD. I can't. The name is a half a mile long, but it, it's the GSD. If you tr- if you uh, cut it down in German, but GSD doesn't work in English, so they call it the security service. Yeah, for which so, makes it which makes it pretty obvious for anybody you know that has any sense of history and knowing you know in English what they are representing. That, but that also was one of the rumors of why the show was canceled because uh, some groups were doing it too militaristic. You know, everybody's wearing the black uniform and they stand up really straight and they have boots on. And, you know, you can see where I'm going with this. Yes. So they wanted to, they didn't want that in Germany in the 1960s. Yeah. So it could have had a lot of factors going in with it where maybe it was the production was high and then there was the other things they were getting 
negative feedback and they decided, well, is it worth the, is it worth all the hassle that we're getting from this show where if it, they wouldn't have had the hassle, they might've been able to say, well, this is going, this is taking off. Let's keep it going. Even though the production's high, we can keep mm-hmm. it running. So they could have, it could have been maybe the reason it was stopped up in seven episodes was multiple factors. It might, it might never be one. It might have, it might have been several reasons, and it, would, and it got to be so many they decided not to do it. But I do like um, the first episode of Tag from Space is the is the English yeah. version of it for listeners that are following along, and it's interesting because you see how the, Cliff, you know, the the main guy, is telling his crew how they're going to handle her, her because they're all worried because she can give alpha orders to him to force him to do stuff and she's going to be relaying an information so there's that tension there but he's not worried about her because they, they him and the crew have ways they could work around it so to speak where they um, use their little tricks and other stuff on her because she's not used to being up in the ships so she has so she has um, some um, noviceness to her you know where she has some um, ideas she's not sure she's being pranked or not Yes, they, 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 there's a very fun exchange about a, a damaged satellite where uh, they want to destroy it. Oh, first of all, they're demoted from the line combat ship, the Space Patrol, which McLean says is a job for cadets. Anybody could do that job. So they go out there, and their first sweep is to monitor communication. And they come across a satellite that's, that's broke. It's not working anymore. And they're going to just destroy it as a uh, hazard to shipping. And right away, Tamara, who is the uh, security officer, tells them you should just catalog it and uh, they'll send a repair ship to repair it. And he says, it's just in the way. And it's no use. And they start arguing right there. Right, The very first thing they encounter, they start an argument. And he tells them, well, we, we can't send communications anyway because the satellite is destroyed. And there's a space storm going on. So they have to leave the satellite there. And then she tells them, move on to your next position. And he says, we can move on because there's a uh, robot cargo ship coming through called the Challenger. Now, stepping, stepping aside for a minute, Challenger is an English name. I looked up the German name and there's really no equivalent. So... Once again, the English words are being used when they need it in the German language. So, okay, back into the story. Uh, they move on to the next space station, and they're supposed to just fly by. And since these guys are all veterans and everybody out in space knows each other, they don't get a message from their friend Clarence, who's on the space station. And the security officer says, it's no big deal, he just didn't call. And he says, Clarence would never not call. So they divert their mission to go investigate why didn't Clarence call? Now, it could have been, you know, got sick, I forgot, you know, but they knew something was wrong. And sure enough, something's wrong. And uh, when the the meat of the story starts to happen, uh, everybody's going into action and the security officer doesn't know what to do. She's just standing there. She's not a real member of the crew. And McLean tells her to radio Earth and tell them that we're, you know, there's something seriously wrong out here. And she says, what about the solar storm? And he just looks at her. You, you believe that? <laughs> you know, are you that stupid that you believe there's a storm? <laughs> and then she gives him a look. Yeah. He's a look. Wow. I thought so, that was funny because because he says that and she's just like, what? And, and, and like you said, totally innocently believing it, but. But to even add yeah. more to their argument about the satellite, when he says we can't communicate with them, so we got we should just destroy it. And she goes, well, even if we can't communicate, they've already got a ship in route, a repair ship in route, and she and, and they're looking at her like, you actually think that's going to happen? That they're going to send the repair yeah. ship for yeah. that? Because she's like, we can salvage it and save it because of the, and, and and get the money and save the money that we would spend it if you destroy it. And it was just it was just hilarious, like the 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 bureaucratic part of her. And, and those... The veterans that know how everything really works is different than the people who just read the books on how things should work. You know, once again, they could, you know, they diverted the entire mission because Clarence didn't give them a call. 
Exactly. Well, that, it kind of reminds exactly what you said down there. But the whole point of endpoint of satellite reminds me with law enforcement that does a patrol, and they know the area. And there's especially the old days when people used to walk a beat, which would be definitely in the '60s. You know, and, and people used right. to know their neighborhood, and they'd be like, "Wait a minute, you know, so and so isn't at their store," and they'd, they'd go check. Now it could be because they're sick and and didn't have work there at that time or whatever. But there could be a reason that something's going on why they didn't, ha- you know, they couldn't come to the thing. So they go and check on them, and then they find out, hey, there is something to miss, and like it could be a robbery going on or something else. Which is in the case of the satellite, something is going to miss, and we get introduced to this show's version of the Klingons or the Romulans or pick whatever Star Trek mainstay villain. We get the frogs. The frog, yes. Uh... On the station, they send two men in one of the little shuttles to uh, check out what's going on at the station. And uh, they wear these really cool spacesuits. And they have to go into the station, and they find out there's no oxygen in the station at all. And the crew is not only dead, but they're frozen in position. Like, uh, one of the crewmen is picking, holding a cup of coffee out in the air, and his arm is frozen in that position. And they immediately realize there's something seriously wrong here. So they contact the ship to tell, you know, tell her that there's really something going on out here. When they notice an alien, now this alien is the coolest alien I've ever seen in a production TV show. Because it's rough, I mean, as roughly a rough as you can imagine, humanoid shape, but it's all energy. It's like reflected light crystals, but you can almost see through it. And it just walks along with like a sucking sound. <laughs> and uh, the whole station is made of aluminum. So you think it would be a clanging sound, but it's more like a sucking sound. It's really creepy. <laughs> and it's sort of like, a, sort of board like in that it ignores the two men that are there. You know, it's just going about doing what it wants to do. And our two guys are there, and we're even shooting at it. And it doesn't bother it at all because the, the laser beam, I'm sorry, the light casters, mm-hmm. as they translate it from the German. <laughs> In fact, uh, doing a little research, the word laser was first used on a German television show. In this show, the word laser. So, you know, a little bit of a separated by two different languages. So, our two heroes look at it and they, for whatever reason, they call it a frog. I, I didn't think it looked very frog-like. Did it look frog-like to you, see? I was, when I read ahead of time, before I saw the thing, it's like, oh, we were going to encounter frogs. I'm thinking, I was thinking something totally different. But right. I think what they pulled off, effect-wise, was cooler than I was a picturing that would probably be there. You know, so uh, I think it worked better for them to have this light creature type thing, which... Also, their race is super intelligent, super advanced, whatever way you want to look at it. And usually, if they're if this is a chess game, they are moving two or three steps ahead of the crew because when, when the crew goes back to the, the shuttle, they find out that they disabled the shuttle. They've done all these other things, and so they've already figured out like, oh, we look, they're going to do this and this and this. We don't have to pay attention to them because somebody else is already taking care of these other issues. And I thought that was rather interesting how you have this superior race as you said like the Borg where you're now encountering them and you're getting them right off the bat in the first episode who the baddies are that are going to be reappearing in the episodes to follow and this is also a situation where less is more they don't ever really show you a close up of the alien it's from a distance and you can look at it and your brain is going to fill in well it looks like it's got two arms it looks like it has two legs but it's really just a blob of light moving along. It, it, it was really a well-done effect. I really enjoyed it. And it, let's go back to talk about the special effects for a second. Uh, we touched on the blue screen news with the uh, undersea uh, casino. And the spaceship itself, they made a physical model, but they also photographed it from different angles. And they actually used printed cutouts and just slid them across a moving screen 
to show the spaceship in flight, which I've done similar effects with my TV in my house and my video camera. <laughs> so so they were working with what they had. And it worked. I mean, you just look at it and you say, okay, yes, that is a spaceship flying through space. It's not up to Star Wars quality. You know, it's not even up to Star Trek quality, but it is. Okay, I understand. That's what they're doing. They're moving. A spaceship is flying through space. But I've never seen that light effect creature before. And I thought that was really cool. Somebody really thought outside the box for that one. Yeah, it, it, when I first saw it, I was getting the the predator vibe when the predator's in its camouflage mode. Oh yeah, so and you see it moving. It's just like, oh, this is this, and then you, which automatically once you're faking predator, you're faking these things could really be fierce because you know automatically faking that movie. This is a totally different creature than that, and but it automatically ups the threat level because now it's hard for you to see i mean they you know they, they they blend in so well with the background so it's hard to see them and their ships are different in design and they're 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 like fighter ships they're smaller and they're also faster than these right. cruiser ships so they're, they're higher they're, they're, they got faster ships different technology uh, that's uh, more advanced and who knows what weapons they're going to be able to use which we'll find out when we talk about episode two some of the things they can pull off and attempt and it really, it really ups the threat level. Like, what are we engaging with, and how did they take over this base, the satellite, without anybody right. knowing? And I forgot to mention that this is humankind's first encounter with intelligent aliens up to this point, which is roughly five hundred years in the future. It's only been human beings. They have fought wars, but it was always the Earth against the uh, colonies. So the Earth was able to win, you know, rather easily. So there's a little bit of arrogance going on. You know, we can handle anything out there in space. And their first encounter with aliens, they're way outclassed. And now they have to start wondering, is is our technology going to work? Is our weapon systems going to work? Because we're finding this out. And we'll find out when we get to episode two, which I'm sure we're going to be talking about soon, how, how outclassed they are with the possibilities of what can come at them. Right. Uh, I don't want to spoil the whole episode, but it, it's pretty exciting. There's a lot of exposition going on. I actually, when I, when I first discovered the show a few years back, I was actually uh, going after a different show called Space Patrol. There was a British uh, Mary Nation show, not a Gary Anderson, uh, like Thunderbird show. It was a different company that made it. it. was called Space Patrol, and I found out about that one. Now I was trying to do a little bit of a dive into that show when I came across this show, and I immediately abandoned that other one, and I went into this one. So I saw that episode twice. I watched it twice a few years ago. I had to hook me into this show. And then uh, the English subtitles actually went away. Some Whoever posted them shut down his YouTube channel for whatever reason. And then it, two years ago, they came back in English subtitles, so which was really cool. And I will say, I don't want to spoil it either, but it, this this episode it is less action than than at least the next two episodes, and it is talking, but it also is setting up all the characters and all the supporting characters that are on Earth, and so you got a lot of people that it's introducing and setting and setting the ground world building, so to speak, up because you're introduced to the major villain of the piece and all the other stuff. So all the things are set for the rest of the series. And I think that's why I said, once you get through episode two, you know, once, once you, once you have episode two, you'll get an idea what the, you know, the, the series is going to be like, because now it's established everything. So now they can go to town with the world. That they've been you know, we find out that the crew is a very tight family and they're resentful of the outsider that's been thrust upon them. Uh, we find out that the earth is run by bureaucrats at the highest level, like generals and security officers and uh, civilian government are always squabbling with each other with rather high pitched voices. <laughs> and uh, we find out there is an alien race out there that is more advanced than the human race. So the, the odds are really 
I mean, they're out there on the very first episode. And like I said, I'm not too familiar with, with German uh, or even European television. This is a long format show. They set up things in the first episode that pay off in the seventh episode, whereas Star Trek in, 19, in the 1960s was episodic. You could watch one episode, be thoroughly entertained, and then watch any other episode completely out of order and uh, be thoroughly entertained with that one also, not knowing everything that happened in between. Exactly, and this episode sets up for us to go to Planet Off Course, which is the second episode, and this is where the frogs have made their their move on the planet Earth and have now I know the science on this probably doesn't match up with anything that we really know, but at this time they sent a planet in direct collision course with Earth and they call it a supernova. Right. So. And they, they they call it a couple of different things during the entire episode. And one of them is I, I listen to the German in the background and read the subtitle and they definitely say the English word supernova. And uh, which would be a sun that they've been able to move through space and launch it at the Earth to completely destroy the planet, which the physics behind that would be, <laughs> we might as well just surrender right now. It's just, so I always assumed that it was some type of comet that they were using. And uh, the translation just got mixed up. But they do say the word, the, the English word supernova, in the actual German dialogue. But once again, I think we have to remember that these are written by TV writers, not by science fiction writers, or even anybody with any kind of real science background. I look at it as, okay, when you go to certain things, you just give certain things a, a break. It's the, 19, it's the mid-1960s, right. 66. I was just like, it's a cool concept. It's a super weapon that they're using and I'm just, I'm, I'm just in for it. I'm not, I wasn't letting the science bother me. I'm just, I'm bringing it up in case anybody listens. Like they're calling it this. There's always going to be the people. I know that they're really in the science and this is, and for some people, this could be a huge barrier. I mean, it's just, everybody has that different threshold, but if you could just get over that part, it is something that the earth is trying to stop. And, Mm -hmm. and, and this is where you get a lot of, the bureaucracy you get a lot of the generals talking and the government talking and the uh, uh, the secret service type thing talking and all the, they're all coming up trying to come up with these plans and they're realizing that there's not much they can do with it if you're in if you're into gritty realism in your tv show there would be a lot of bureaucrats talking while a catastrophe of this proportion was going going on now, our hero, McLean, is a man of action. So he's just not going to sit there while this supernova is barreling towards the Earth. They immediately give him a suicide mission to go out there and stop it. And uh, he wants to do the uh, Grand Slam because his, his old boss, the General Van Dyke, is trapped in her starship in the very path of this supernova. So not only does he want to go out there and stop the supernova, he wants to rescue General Van Dyke and her crew. So he really, you know, that there's your hero right there. He says, not only are we going to save the day, we're going to save everybody. Which also, so they launch, I was gonna say, which also puts them in another conflict with Tamara again, where um, about priorities, which also is a, Tamara is on the same side as General Van Dyke, and and say no, no, no. You got to you got to think the big picture. You got to save the planet Earth. But then, you know, if you have time, she doesn't save. But then, if you have time, you can come back and get me. It's unsaid, but it's you know, you got to you got to prioritize. Do you save just like a handful of people, or do you save I don't know how many people on the planet Earth at this particular time? But we'll, we'll save well, were, millions. They were debating. They were debating about calling back every spaceship to get as many people off the Earth. And the one general said it would just still be a fraction. You know, with, with the combined fleet, they couldn't move more than a frat, which is probably real. And then they said, and then who decides who goes? And he looked at all the uh, aircraft and he said, of course, you guys are all going to Mars where the uh, backup government would be. And then the one general says, well, I wouldn't leave. And the other one says, well, somebody's got to run this show, you know. 
And once again, it's that bickering and infighting when they have a, a disaster they have to deal with. There was that one funny scene in uh, Dr. Strangelove when they realized that the Russians had the uh, Beansday weapon. And they said, well, what are we going to do? He said, well, we're going to have to go deep in deep mine shafts. And of course, everybody here in the war room is important, so they have to go down there too. And then they said, now and then we're going to move, you know, 10 women for every man because you have to repopulate there. <laughs> this is what they're talking about when they should be trying to stop the Russians from setting up their Tuesday bomb. <laughs> so there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff, you know. I was once told there's only like six or seven basic plots out there and you're just variations of the same plot. So, uh, People are rearranging the deck on the, the deck chairs on the Titanic and thinking seems to be a common plot out there. Yeah, and then this one, it's it's rather ingenious what they tried to do to stop the um, let's say planet destroying device. You know, correct. Uh, uh, you know, which is a doomsday weapon, by, <laughs> which is controlled by the frog. It's not a random occurrence. The frogs have launched this weapon at the Earth. To destroy the entire planet. And at first they think yeah. that, the, that they're still oh. controlling it and that they're still running it. So they go for the what they think is the control station and then eventually they realize that that doesn't work and they have to take on the doomsday device head on, so to speak. And right. so we're, we're not going to tell you listeners, uh, do they stop the doomsday device? Do they save everybody? Well, I guess you could make an argument. We could figure out they did stop the Doomsday Device yeah, because there are, there, there's five more episodes. But, yeah. but did they save everybody, or does any of the crew die? You won't know. We're not telling you. Yeah. You'll have to watch the episode. <laughs> because the Doomsday Device is taken care of, but that happens at the, I think, about the two-thirds of the way through the episode port part, yeah, and then it gets multiple cliffhangers. There's a, there's a lot more meat after the what you would think would be the big problem with Saul. There's still a lot more meat. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, there are multiple layers in this show, and what could be the end of an episode is just the end of part one. And that's what I liked about this episode. This I said this episode will hook you for the rest of the series, I think, uh, because you're just like, okay, this – because I actually thought, all right, they're going to take care of this. They're having trouble getting it because the, the control station, didn't, that didn't pan out. They um, did two attempts to take the disabled, the doomsday thing. So you had these, you know, what you think, okay, they couldn't get on the first try. Oh, but they got it on the second try. That for a normal show, Mark, we all know, yeah. for a movie, for a normal movie, that's the end. I mean, you have a little epilogue thing, and that's it, possibly. But no, this has a, you have, another one and another one. And so it goes on a little more with that. The net of stakes are lower than the whole planet, but they're still stakes. Right. Right. And Tamara and Cliff really bump heads on this one about what the priority of the mission is. And she even pulls a gun on him at one point. She's going to shoot him. Now, another similarity of Star Trek does, the guns that they have have a sun setting, which they call the paralyzer, and a uh, cutting beam. Now, they, I don't believe the uh, Rom Patrol guns have a disintegrating disintegration setting, but they do have a cutting beam and a sun setting in their guns. So, once again, the two productions had no idea they were going on. There's a lot of similar things. There was one time when they were getting uh, lunch, and the food dispenser looked almost exactly like the one from Star Trek. They put a little chip in the uh, in the slot, and then the door opens up, and the guy's sandwich and coffee are there. So, and that's right out of the other show, you know? You can tell me which one came first, the chicken or the egg on that one. <laughs> and, and I will say this, something I didn't mention with the first episode, but when they're on, when they're in the Starlight Casino, they do some unique dancing they, they definitely tried to do what they consider futuristic dancing styles because it's it's no style i ever seen before but i gotta give them props for attempting something different a, a, a writing prompt in star trek was don't ever try to depict futuristic music so if you watched all of next generation they always played classical music whenever there was a concert they were playing classical music 
uh, Ron Petroli had no problem with futuristic music and futuristic dancing. It's something that has to be seen to believe. And it goes on in the background like it's normal every day. It's like nobody stops and looks at the people dancing because that's the way they dance. And it's some kind of choreographed, synchronized, square dancing. I don't know. I don't know how you call it. <laughs> It reminded me of the times we'd see sometimes we'd see dancing like in Buck Rogers and some other uh, 25th century and some other stuff where you're just looking at it like, man, I've never seen anybody do that kind of dance. And But hey, who's to say, Mark, we could be wrong. 500 years from now when you and I are both gone, this that could be the way. And we'll be fortunate enough have- not to have lived long enough to actually be doing it. <laughs> After this broadcast, Ron Petroli could hit and within a year all the kids could be dancing that way. That one, I, that's when I know that, that things have gone bad. <laughs> <laughs> the future's so bright. If that, what, who knows? If that dance style hits, I'll be like, they, they called it all. They got everything right. Oh, my Lord. Uh, now we got to worry about frogs. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And uh, let's uh, skip over to the third episode if you want to. Sure, keepers. Like I said, I Keepers of the sure. Law, which I thought is a classic sci-fi premise of an episode. You know, basically it's um, humans and the robots, and there's issues with the robots, and they use Eisenhower's three laws of robots. You know, the the, the three laws wow. of robotics, and I, I thought that was just oh, they're doing the and they're, and they're explaining. I'm like, this is so cool how they're and it's set up so well at the beginning of the episode how these how these problems could occur. Because of the programming being faulty and how they could just interpret it in a one way off and then go askew. Now, when I was a boy, uh, my father, my brother, and I went to the local community college where Isaac Asimov was actually going to speak. And I was very young, so I just sat there and I listened. I didn't even dare raise my hand to ask a question. But uh, the three laws of robotics, this would be the early 1970s now. So the three laws of robotics were brought up, and Isaac Asimov told a story of a, a Japanese auto worker that was accidentally killed when he fell into a, uh, a early robot that was building a car on an assembly line. Now it's modern, almost the entire assembly line is almost all automatic. But this was in the early 70s. And this auto worker accidentally fell in there and the robot it did its job and killed him. And people actually, he said, people called me up and said, I think, what about the first law? How come that didn't stop the look? And he says, I made that all up, you know, it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> so in this story, uh, as mentioned in the first story, the young officers on the general staff are saying in just a couple of years, robots will be doing all the work out in space. In this story, once again, our crew is on patrol. Even after saving the Earth in the last episode, they're still stuck on patrol. You know, they're not uh, reinstated to their full status. And they're on patrol, and they come across a uh, freighter ship which is commanded by one of Cliff's old instructors. So once again, there's that human part where I know this guy, if he says something's not right, something's not right. And uh, the old captain says, this automated mining facility is just sending us scrap. They're not sending us ore. They're just sending us refuse. All All our ship does is fly by and pick up these rockets that they launch, which is supposed to have ore in them, but the last time it just had refuse in it. And he said, we couldn't stop, but I know you, McLean, you can go and check it out. And sure enough, they check it out, and there's supposed to be humans and robots on the planet, and when they get there, all they encounter are robots. And the robots are really cool. They're saucer shaped with some kind of cone for a head, and they have four arms or six arms, depends on the robot, with a dryer hose arm, exhaust hose arm, and they have a kitchen cutlery for uh, hands, 
the one is a melon baller. It's clear. It's clear as day that it's a melon baller. So, well, like I said, they, they worked with what they had. But the way they got these things to move is they superimposed an image of a robot over the film. And as they would back the camera up, it looked like the robot was coming forward. And it was really cool for the, for the pennies that they spent doing it. They actually got a non-humanoid robot to look like it was gliding across the surface of the room where they were in. Really impressed. I was really impressed with that effect. I was impressed too because you know right away you're thinking oh it's going to be a person in the the robot thing walking or moving or or like they're like on a on a um uh, a, a, a tray you know like a cart type thing you know something to have it glide so you don't see legs or whatnot and it, it really had a good effect and I was thinking oh this ought to be interesting to see how they pull this off and and they pulled it off really well and they talk about how you have to disable it and go through that whole thing. And I love it that they're getting trained that, and that's when they get pulled on their mission. So now they're trying to remember what was said. And yeah, because they, they, they were actually goofing off when they were being briefed on how robots are, how they actually work, and how you can, if there's a problem, you can disable them by doing this. And the whole crew, except for the security officer, was just goofing off in the audience. And they really weren't paying attention. Well, they give if they weren't, but also to give him credit when he was explaining how he how he did it. That is also when they were pulled. And I think it when when they showed one of the robots going berserk, it kind of got their attention where they were interested then, because that was the whole point of him, you right. know, the, the the instructor showing that. And I love it. It was that well, we set it to Y eighteen to start with, and then we that the. Then do we move it to set Y seventeen or Y nineteen? Yeah. Is it going to make it worse? It's the old. Do I cut the green wire or the red wire? <laughs> it's the human factor again. <laughs> do we do it before or after? Yeah. I think we do this. Are you sure? I'm not sure. <laughs> it could go either way. So, but I thought it was interesting is that they found out the robots due to something that happened on the mining colony. Um, they, yeah. their, their program got reversed where they would do the opposite. And that was because there was, um, a revolt, so to speak, where a couple of people oh. did some stuff wrong and they, and the robots saw a, another human kill another human. Right. And that's what the fighter programming out of whack. I, that, that really confused them. So once again, the, those robots, they had, the, the, the writers were really dipping in. I think add them off with the three laws of robotics. And uh, I don't even know if Mr. Asimov was ever aware that they used that in that show. Because once again, it, it didn't make it over here until I, the 21st century. So. Well, he was but, uh, well-traveled, so you never know. He, he could have been. You never know. And there's always fans from other countries that could have said to him, oh, they did this, this show. So. There, there is a better chance than normal that he might have found out. Yeah, I mean, he could have been perfectly fine with it. You know, if it drives him to read my book, then that's, that's great, right? <laughs> yeah, and anybody that's read his books is going to know right away where they're going, and I think it's it's, it's a good tribute to it. And uh, but I, I enjoyed that episode. It was it was, and that's what I'm saying. The second and the third episode are so strong that uh, for right. anybody that enjoys science fiction, you're going to enjoy. This series, I've seen, like I said, the first three episodes. You've watched all seven at least a couple times, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just finished up number seven today. I watched it again. And it's really good. It's a lot better than I remembered it was. It was. And so, well, you know, we're, we're going to revisit this again because I, I had a really good time today. But uh, the show was super progressive. It had many women on the ship. Women were in positions of power. They were well respected. There was a lot of flirting going on, which, you know, maybe that's the way things were done in the future. But uh, when it came down to it, the crew always pulled together as a family. And it kind of gave me a loss of space vibe in that way, which if you want to compare it to another show. But they were a family. They, they loved each other, and they were going to go whatever it took. And in the first episode, uh, they were the logical thing to do would have been to abandon the two men on the base and make a run for it. 
to get the word back to Earth. And McLean was, you could see, it was really conflicting him. I'm not going to leave two of my men behind and do the right thing. I'm going to do what I think is right. And there's that Captain Kirk bit in there, you know. Yeah, the needs of the, the needs of the few outweigh the needs of the many in his mind instead of the opposite way. And we brought up about the generals and the people at Earth. I want to say one of the nice scenes that I really enjoyed in episode two was when General um, Winston Woodrow Wamsler, the, the, Wamsler, the, yeah. yeah, when he finds out when he thinks something bad happened to McLean. And every and and of course this back going back to the doomsday thing when everybody finds that the doomsday weapon is destroyed, and everybody else is celebrating, and he, if I remember, he was standing. I think that he sat that, and he was everybody else had oh. left the room, and he just realizes if this happened, then something bad probably happened to him because they hadn't heard from right. him yet, and I think the actor sold that so well that it's this is not a time to celebrate. This is a time to mourn the loss of this guy who, and, and when you go by the first episode, you wouldn't think this general would be affected so way, so much by this. But in the second episode, he's so much more defending McLean that you could see that part going in. And I remembered when, during that episode, they were talking about how they needed a miracle. Like, we need a miracle. And I think the same guy said, if there is such a thing as a miracle, then it is McLean. I mean, you know, what a line, you know, it's just, you know, you have your faith in this guy. But uh, you're going to be entertained with the next four episodes because they really pour it on, on how much of a hero McLean is. They really, they really give it to him. And he doesn't like it. He doesn't like that kind of talk. He's just, I'm just a guy, you know. Yeah. I'm just doing it's a really, job. It's a, it's, a, it's a fun show. It's something you haven't seen before. And you can't really say it's derivative because they didn't know anything about Star Trek when they made this show. So it, it's its own thing. And it just by one of those cosmic coincidences, they did very much like another show that was made on the other side of the world. Which it makes you wonder of like how how many other ideas, like you know, people say, oh, this idea is similar to that. He must have stole it. But it's like, no, people can come up about this spontaneous, you know, spont- in, in their own way, the same, right. you know, um, and, and have those things. Uh, and it's, it's still, but it, but it's different, similar, but it is so different and it's so enjoyable. My, my grade school teacher taught me that six different men came up with the telephone at almost exactly the same time. And it just so happened that Alexander Graham Bell hadn't it first. So he, he went down in history as the creator of the telephone. When if he didn't go to the patent office that day, some other guy would have gotten in there first and he wouldn't have gone down in history as a creator of the telephone. So now Mark, I know you are a comic creator. Well, with them force and stuff like that. Oh, well, I'm, I'm created. I wrote for them. I didn't create that one. Well, wrote, but I mean, the comic creator meaning that you write stories right. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. what else do you still do that? Do you still write for them force? I have, I have not written for them force, uh, in a while. I was a backup story writer, and it used to be an 80-page black and white comic, and they would have a uh, main story that had the entire team in the front of the book, and then in the back of the book, they would have eight and ten-page backup stories with the individual team members, and that's what I would write. I would write the backup story. Uh, It just so happened that exactly right before the pandemic hit, they they made the decision down in Florida to switch the book to a traditional 24 page color comic. And that meant that the backup stories were no longer needed. So I was very, we, we parted on very good terms. And uh, then the pandemic hit, and then they really brought everything in house. So there's, there really isn't anybody except the core group making that comic now. So, But I was very fortunate. I had a great eight, nine year run. I was teamed up with very good artists. And my editor was very receptive to my crazy ideas. He, he only rejected maybe two or three of my stories that I sent in. So I had a very great run. I was very key with my run on Sun Court. Is there no- and that's where, that's where my editor told me there are only six stories out there. And it's how you redraft them. 
As I say, I've seen you and I are Facebook friends, and I'll see you every so often that you're posting your different conventions and that kind of stuff. So I know you know people I, can follow well, you and can go and see and go and meet you and talk to you at these conventions. Well, Facebook is I'm on Facebook every day. So if anybody wants to talk to me, they'll they'll learn all about me on Facebook. That's my one jam. I tried the whole crossover all the different platforms. I just couldn't keep up. I'm too old. I'm too old for that. <laughs> so. You can find me on Facebook. I'm right there. I accept just about every friend request that comes my way. And uh, yeah, somebody just contacted me, a friend I met who actually lives in the UK. And he said that uh, they just played House of the Gorgon, Joshua Kennedy's movie, House of the Gorgon, on a British TV show. And he contacted me and said, I saw you in that movie. And that's cool. That's 4,000 miles away. Yeah, somebody recognized me. Well, that's a crazy feeling for a guy like me from New Jersey. <laughs> well, that's what I love. That's what I love about the modern technology nowadays. Is the, the good if you if you embrace the good parts, is you're able to reach out and contact people like you and I doing this for Derek. And I want to thank you for helping me out with this episode. Uh, for, for it's that way, Derek and Beth can worry about getting their haunts taken care of, and Derek doesn't have to worry about what's coming to come out next. And to, for let listeners know. I think you and I are going to be doing another episode or two. We're obviously going to do the last four episodes of this series. Right. And I think the other one was the ghost in the invisible bikini. That's a favorite of mine. Yep. So, we, so Mark will be back with me for two other episodes as we, as I do my Steve rivers run with monster kid radio and that kind of stuff. And I want to thank you again so much. It, this, this was fun. And I, I had to have you come over on my show to do a movie where we decide to, we roll the die and decide the genre and you get to pick the movie from there. And that one opens up all the movies. That sounds like a lot of fun. Huge thanks. Huge, huge thanks to Steve Turek for stepping up and filling in for me while I was supposed to be in Kuwait with Beth and a bunch of zombies. I really appreciate all the work that he did to make sure that you had semi-regular episodes of Monster Kid Radio. Believe me, the reason the show hasn't been coming out on a weekly basis has nothing to do with him and has all to do with me trying to get my footing back underneath me since we've been back home. We'll talk a little bit more about what's coming up on Monster Kid Radio here in a second. Before that, though, I want to say thank you to Mark Holmes for being part of the episode this week. Thanks to Mark Matsky and Kenny for their segments. And thanks to everybody who joined Steve during his guest hosting stint here on MKR. Please make sure you check out his own podcast, the Diecast Movie Review Podcast is available wherever you download your podcasts, and I'll make sure there are links in the show notes to everything that he's got going on as well. So thank you, Steve, and everybody else. The show notes are available over at monsterkidradio.net, where you're going to find everything you need to know about this podcast. You're going to find links to everything we've talked about. You're going to find links to our Facebook page, our Facebook group, our Twitter, our Discord, our Patreon, our Reddit, and I think that's about it. Now, our Amazon affiliates over there as well. We are an Amazon affiliate, so if you're going to buy anything on Amazon, please consider using the Amazon affiliate link. It doesn't change anything for you. It just takes a couple of pennies out of Jeff Bezos' pockets and puts them into the Monster Kid Radio coffers. And believe you me, every little bit helps. So please consider shopping that way. Speaking of shopping, you can also support us by buying a shirt. We have our shirts available for sale now. If you go over to our Big Cartel page, go to deathdesigns.bigcartel.com. And death is spelled D-E-T-H, remember. You can find five of our shirts that we have for sale, including our popular Crestwood House tribute shirt, our popcorn shirt, and the Monster Movie Collage shirt. They're all Hawaiian-style shirts. You can pick them up for $40 a piece. Sizes range from extra small to 8XL if you need to go that large and you know, I, I'm very comfortable in my 5XL, and I love these shirts, and I would love for you to get one as well. There will be a link in the show notes to that, too. Shall we talk about what's coming up over the next few episodes of Monster Kid Radio? Yeah? You want that? Well, I want that. And it's my show, so you're going to get it. Here's what's going to happen. Uh, later this week, we're dropping another episode of Monster Kid Radio, because I want to get back on track desperately. And it's going to be me. I'm going to be talking with Anastasia Elfman about Lon Chaney Sr. and her movie that she's touring right now with her husband, director Richard Elfman. 
The movie is called Bloody Bridget, and it's not just a movie. She puts on a whole show. She's going to come to talk about that here on Monster Kid Radio later this week. The next week, Matt Rashley is coming back on the show. Matt Rashley is one of my oldest friends. We were trying to figure out a reason to get him on the show, and he and I both discussed a number of different topics, and the one we settled on is the year in monster movies, 1954. 1954 saw at least two, if not three or four, iconic monster movies come out, as well as a handful of others. And we're going to talk about what 1954 means to Monster Kid Dumb and the movies that we love so much and the influence that they've had to this very day. After that, Beth is going to come on the show, and we are kind of torn on how we're going to talk about this. I keep talking about filling my who hole. She wants to take us to Whoville. We're going to talk about some classic Doctor Who. Finally, I'm going to get some Doctor Who in me, and we're going to go old school. We're going to start from the very, very beginning classic black and white classic Doctor Who. I'm excited for this. This has not happened yet. We haven't sat down to watch anything yet, but I am very eager to make this happen. I've already decided we're going to buy popcorn that day. We're going to have some nice sugar-free sodas. We're going to have a good old time watching some Doctor Who. So that's what you can expect for the next three episodes of Monster Kid Radio. I'm feeling pretty energized about getting back to the business of being a Monster Kid Radio podcaster. I know that I haven't really been in the driver's seat for most of these episodes. I'm excited to take control of the reins again and bring Monster Kid Radio to you the way that we used to and then some. Like I said a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was last week or the last episode, I want to kind of change things up and refresh things. So you can expect some content from Team Death coming up that has nothing to do with you know the classic monster movie stuff, but kind of because it's about monster kid stuff that, that you know what I mean. It's my show. I do what I want. But you're going to get some Team Death content. You're going to get some mail order zombie content. You're going to get some Monster Kid radio content moving down the line. But the primary focus of the podcast will always be the classic monster movies and classic monster television in the case of Doctor Who. And who knows what else we're going to talk about in the future. I do want to talk about Star Trek more in the future. So maybe that'll come up down the line as well. Stay tuned. Monster Kid radio head. Is that what Kenny calls y'all? Anyway, that's what's coming up in the future of Monster Kid Radio. Stay tuned to monsterkidradio.net for further updates. In the meantime, until next time, remember, the Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution. Uh... (laughs) I've said it for 10 years. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0, unported license. I'm going to leave that flub in there because it's funny. This, of course, does not apply to the song Armed and Crazy in Space. This is copyright 2024, The Hamiltones. You can find them at thehamiltones.bandcamp.com or you can check them out at their record label, Swimming Faith Records at swimmingfaithrecords.com. You can also check out their Instagram, instagram.com slash swimmingfaith. However you track them down, let them know that you heard about them here on Monster Kid Radio. My name is Derek M. Cook. Special thanks to my wife for providing the German pronunciation at the top of the show. I'll talk to everybody in a couple of days. Ciao. (laughs) 